Your whole audience is leaving. Yeah. <laughs> Not whole audience. All the Most of the two of us. Three. 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 Uh, four. <laughs> He's preaching to himself this morning. <laughs> okay, good morning. Good morning. Um, Technically, we'll start, we're going to go through a series of um, verses, so we're going to be jumping around quite a bit. Um, we'll start at Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.15. Uh, just an overview, we looked last week at the veracity of the scriptures, or in other words, that the Word of God is truly God's Word. Um, so anything following as far as that would be um, presented as evidence is going to be based on that fact. That, because that's really where we get anything as far as with regard to uh, the deity of Christ, virgin birth, uh, veracity of miracles, and uh, nece uh, necessity of blood atonement. Uh, all that basically comes from the scripture. So if you don't have the foundation that uh, scriptures are, or if you're, when you're approaching somebody, when you're dealing with somebody on, um, what, as far as evangelistically, when you're, when you're just interacting with them, if you don't have that that common ground as far as the fact that uh, you know this is this is actually God's word, then you're not really going to get very far. Right? You're not really going anywhere because you can't. All, all the facts that we have basically come from that, from the word of God. So if you don't have that, then you don't you don't really have common ground on which to approach. Uh, last week, again, we looked at that, and then this week we are looking at. Um, I'm combining two of them: uh, virgin birth and. Um, just the, the deity of Christ. Okay, so to me, they, they, they're kind of similar because uh, one's founded on the other. Uh, so the first instance that we have of any mention with regard to virgin birth or the fact of uh, super, supernatural birth, here we have in Genesis 3, uh, verse 15. Okay, and it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise uh, his heel. Now, this is in reference, uh, I mean, we all know this, what this is. This is uh, God speaking uh, to Adam and Eve and to the serpent as well. Uh, and this was right after uh, you have what would be the fall when Adam took of the fruit. Uh, Eve had taken, she gave to him who was with her. He took of the fruit and then uh, they, their eyes were open, they see that they're naked, and then they sowed themselves fig leaves, and then they hid. So when God comes and calls out for them, they're hiding, and then he questions them with regard, you know, why are you hiding? Well, it's because we were naked. Well, who told you that you were naked? Well, we ate of the fruit. And so then, then you have the blame shifting that occurs. And then you have a number of curses that were pronounced, a curse upon the earth itself, uh, the ground's not going to yield like it had yielded to them before, and that there would be thorns and thistles. Uh, they're going to be eating by the sweat of thy brow. Uh, that is, is that the labor that I would assume probably that the labor would have been similar. The only difference is that you wouldn't have had diminishing of uh, energy um, with regard to them. In other words, you, it would still be the same amount of labor. The only difference is now is that it feels arduous because. Uh, now you have loss of energy, and it, it's, it's taxing on them physically, whereas it wouldn't have been the case before. And then there, there's going to be ch uh, pain in childbirth. But he, he throws this in with regard to, he also curses a serpent, uh, that it's supposed to be um, cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then he mentions this as well in verse 15, that I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Okay, and it's going to bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise its heel. Uh, thrown in there is this promise that he's going to have someone come down the road that is supposed to uh, basically bruise the head of the serpent. In other words, it's going to, this person's going to 
deal a death blow uh, to the serpent and to the serpent's seed. Uh, but as well, uh, this person is going to come from a woman, and it's uh, something unique and supernatural because women don't have seed. Women have egg. So uh, this is why this is believed to be first mentioned of Messianic prophecy that woman is going to have a seed. Okay, so how is that possible? Supernatural. Okay, it's <laughs> just supernaturally. That's how that's possible. It's supernatural. Uh, next two mentions that we would have are in Genesis 49 and then also in Deuteronomy 18 with regard to the Messiah. Uh, we won't look at those. We'll skip down to Proverbs 30. Uh, the only reason why is because that doesn't mention necessarily his supernatural aspect. They just mentions about um, he's going to be with um, Genesis 49. That's to say again. Uh, the deity of Christ and also his virgin birth. So Proverbs 30. Genesis 49 was where you have Jacob, or also known as Israel, was blessing his kids at the end of his life. And then he mentions to Judah in particular that Judah, there's supposed to be a lawgiver that comes from his loins uh, to whom all the people are going to go. And that the, the scepter's not going to depart from Judah uh, until Shiloh come. And that is pointing out that uh, Christ is going to be a ruler. And then Deuteronomy 18 is with regard to, um, this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel and recounting the law. And he particularly states that God is going to raise up a prophet from among the people that's going to be like unto him, like unto Moses, that is, but that he's going to speak on to the people on behalf of God. But this is not just any prophet. This is someone that um, God raises up. And then you have uh, Proverbs 30, next mention. Uh, I had a friend of mine mention that this is <laughs> one of the oldest riddles uh, in the Scripture. So Proverbs 30, verse 4. Okay, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. What is his name and what is his son's name? Now these are a series of rhetorical questions. In other words, uh, who ascends into heaven or descends? Where did people go when they die at this point? I know this is this has been dispensational. Yeah, they would have gone to paradise. Okay, so he was speaking of going into heaven in particular. Yeah. Uh, so he in particular, he's mentioning here. This is where God would be that they would be going to, not just okay going to paradise in particular in Sheol, but they would be going to where God would be. So who ascends or go down? It would have to be obviously somebody that would be supernatural. It would be either God Himself or one of His servants, His messengers that He would send. Uh, who hath gathered the wind in His fists? Yeah, God. Okay, so. Um, and you can go down through all the series of the questions here. Okay, who hath bound the waters in a garment? Only God can do that. Who has established all the ends of the earth? God did. And then He asks, What is His name? And he asked something also that's pretty interesting. What is his son's name? What precedent do we have prior to that that God would have a son? Psalm 2. Yes. So that's pretty interesting that God would mention in prophecy prior, and he puts throughout scripture that you know he has a son. Now we know from reading Romans 1 that it's clearly understood because he's put it in our hearts. Uh, we, we read in Ecclesiastes, he, he put eternity. He put the world in our heart. The other, he put eternity in our heart. The understanding, obviously, the reality of that. God is triune. Okay. Even though the word Trinity is not used in Scripture, but the concept is. It's there. It's very plain. Uh, they use the word Godhead uh, quite frequently uh, to to relate that concept. But we know, okay, God has a son. So, and God is also a spirit. Uh, we're told. Go to Isaiah 7. 
Isaiah 7, and then Isaiah 9 after that, and then we'll go to 53. Isaiah 7, okay, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, and I know that's some more content. Uh, 14, uh, chapter 7, verse 14. Is that what he's talking to Ahaz? Yes, this is dual fulfillment prophecy. The same thing as he's going to mention in chapter 9. Because uh, he was... Uh, in context, what's going on is that uh, he's approached, uh, Ahaz that is, and then he's told, ask God a sign so that he would, you know, yeah, he refused to, and then that's when the prophet comes out and says, hey, well, you know what, God, God himself is going to give you a sign. He's kind of yes. You, yes. <laughs> and then, um, what, here, here is the sign, it says, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, I know this is somewhat contented because of the fact that when Angel came to Mary and Joseph and told them that his uh, son's name, that they were, they were to name their son Jesus. Um, okay, so Emmanuel and Jesus are two different names, obviously. Uh, but Emmanuel being interpreted as God with us. So that's God himself coming down. We see the supernatural nature of this individual. He's going to be born of a woman in particular. It's a virgin. Uh, now, that's another also contended thing. But the word itself that is used it indicates that it's virgin. In other words, I never have known man in a sexual way. It's not just simply a young maiden. And somewhat to put out. Uh, there's two words that are usually used with regard to virgin. Uh, either Alma or Bethula. And then one would be a virgin, like you know, virgin, virgin, as we would think, never have known man, and then the other one being just a young maiden, someone that would be of young age, but not necessarily uh, pure. Well, in this particular case, a word would be that it's a virgin. So it's a virgin is going to conceive and give a son, and it's going to be God with us. Okay, so how does that work? That a virgin, someone that's not known a man, uh, sexually is to give birth. It's yeah, it's miraculous. Okay, it's supernatural. It's not something that is common to take place. Uh, Isaiah 9, just a few chapters over. And then uh, starting in verse 6. And this also gives a little bit more indication of the nature of this individual. Uh, For unto us a child is born, uh, unto us a son is given. Okay, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, uh, the Prince of Peace. And then um, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. Uh, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So his name now, uh, it mentions that it's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, okay, the Everlasting Father. Now this is a child that's to be born, okay, and he's to be called, among other things in this listing, Mighty God and Everlasting Father. Okay, how does that work? If you're to call somebody mighty God and everlasting Father, wouldn't they be put to death for blasphemy? Unless it were really legitimately the case. I know it seems kind of like a silly argument, but the fact is, okay, uh, the word and the prophecies that are given indicate the fact very clearly. I know we understood as far as we're believers here, but the fact is that God himself 
repeatedly states over and over again in Scripture the fact that he is going to send, he's, he himself is coming basically, but um, his son is to be born and he's God, he's equally God, he's supernatural, you know, whereas he's not. Yes, sir. I just wanted to uh, just have a shout out of praise. Last night I was praying about what I should preach on it at the nursing home this afternoon, John Knox. That's exactly what's going to start with Psalm 2. Oh, amen. Uh, Proverbs 30. <laughs> amen. And the deity of Christ. <laughs> amen. It's a really neat subject. And I don't know why so many people trip over it. I don't know. I can't relate to like it was just one of those things that like you know. But I know. Hi, good morning. Uh, we are in Isaiah nine, Isaiah chapter nine. Uh, we're looking at verse six. So um, again, they would if under Jewish law they would be put to death for blasphemy for calling their son such a thing. Mighty God. You know, everlasting Father. You know, aren't we supposed to call him uh, no one Father but one? The fact is, okay, it's it's because this person is God Himself. Also, Emmanuel means God with us. Yes, yes, yes. Good point. Let's go over to Micah. Micah, chapter 5. Now this is a prophecy concerning where Messiah would be born. We see that this would be fulfilled in, and we look in Matthew, uh, as well, well, you see it in Luke as well, but you see it in Matthew in particular, when the wise men came to Jerusalem and then they came to Herod and then Herod asked, his scribes to find, okay, where is Messiah to be born? And then they, they saw in Scripture, okay, they turned to Micah 5, 2, basically. Uh, it says here, But thou, o Bethlehem, Ephratah, thou that, uh, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, okay, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Okay, so now we see another aspect of this is this is messianic, but the fact is this is still relating to the individual that uh, I mean, obviously we know as Christ, and that is is that he was to, he's a ruler, and that he would be born out of Bethlehem, and interestingly, it says of him, um, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. Okay, so it wasn't just that he would come out of Bethlehem. And it wasn't just, okay, that he would be, you know, he would originate there, but it, he doesn't even really have an origin. It says he's of old from everlasting. Now, how, where, where do you get somebody that, how does somebody come from everlasting? Don't we have, like, a starting point? Reading. I guess we don't. John does not yeah. have to be outside. Yeah, God's always existed. So he's outside of that realm from where we find ourselves in. Was we at some point were conceived and then we were birthed. You know, so at some point our life started, our life commenced. His has always been, he's always existed. He's from of old, uh, from everlasting. Okay. So this what did you do before he made man? I have no idea. <laughs> I would assume probably his fellowship with himself. I really don't know. I mean, he uh, he's always been. He's not restricted in any sense as far as uh, things that he's created or whatnot. So, yes, it's, that's really hard to get your mind around that. But God is is he, he lives in eternity and. I've explained it to people trying to talk about salvation. How, how does God, uh, how can uh, predestination, for instance, and free will be, uh, be included? And, and can they both, both occur at the same time? And it's kind of like watching a football game. And you're watching the game, and your friend is calling all the plays before they happen. And then you ask him, "Why did it?" Well, it's on, it's on, it's on tape. <laughs> it's, but the thing is, God sees the end from the beginning, so our entire life is before Him, 
And yeah. it was an eternity past. True. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. It's uh, something that's like mind blowing when you start uh, trying to think about it. Uh, go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not any thing made that was made. In Him was light, or excuse me, was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness uh, comprehended it not. Okay, and then there was a man sent from God, whose name was John, and the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Uh, that all men through him might believe. Okay, He was not that light, uh, speaking of John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light, speaking of Jesus. Uh, that was a true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Um, and then, you know, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Uh, he came into his own, and his own received him, not but as many as received him, to so then gave him power to become uh, the sons of God, even to them uh, that believe on his name, okay, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And then the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is Emmanuel. And we behold his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, uh, full of grace and truth. And we, we could finish reading on through there, but we'll see. Um, John bears record of the fact uh, through, obviously, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus, obviously, was God Almighty in flesh, uh, supernatural. So we have prophecy that was given uh, by God through prophets of old with regard to his son and the fact that he himself would be uh, in flesh. And then you have John giving witness and testimony. Not only do you have uh, the word, the testimony of the word, which really foundationally is what you're going to have to go to if you're going to believe, anybody's going to believe, but you also have testimony of his works. Uh, Jesus himself said uh, to those that were following him that if they believed not for, basically for the prophecy, for the word, that they should believe on him because of the works that he would perform and that he performed. Now, we can go through, well, you can go basically every chapter in John and then you can go through a number of things in Acts, but um, go to John chapter 2. Well, excuse me, we'll stay in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Uh, go down to verse 43. Uh, verse 43. Okay, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Uh, Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Again, Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Then Jesus said unto Nathanael, or Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith unto him, and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Okay, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Okay, and then Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Okay, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily I... Say unto, barely, barely, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, so now we have this little incident here where this is in part of the calling of the Twelve. So he calls Philip, and then Philip calls another individual named Nathaniel. So Nathaniel's like a little skeptical and saying, well, we'll see, you know, can there anything good come out of Galilee? And then so as he was approaching Jesus, uh, Jesus calls out to him and says, oh, wow, an Israelite indeed. 
in whom is no guile. Okay, so this guy is true to the bone. He has uh, a great amount of integrity and character, so much so that God says of him, there's no guile in him. And then he says, wow, you know, where do you know me from? You know, I've never met you before. <laughs> How is it that you know anything about me or my character, my integrity? And then Jesus says, well, before uh, Philip came to come get you, uh, I saw you under a fig tree. So in other words, he would have been probably worshiping God at that point uh, in a private setting. Okay, he would be, you could say he's in his closet, in his prayer closet. And when he said that, Nathaniel recognized, oh wow, only God would know something like that. So here we see, okay, he has supernatural knowledge. Uh, something that would be out of the ordinary for a regular human to be able to know. Uh, again, this is nothing, but this is uh, Nathaniel's own testimony of the fact. Here's, here's what occurred. And he says of it, you know, you are, okay, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Okay? And then Jesus even was kind of marveled and astonished and said, wow, just because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? It's like, hey, <laughs> you know, in other words, his, his, He's kind of astonished, he's like, okay, hey, you have great faith, you know. You, I mean, you're going to see greater things than these that happen, you know. This is just a small thing. I saw you beforehand. Uh, you go to John chapter 2. He's going to turn water into wine. John chapter 3, this is where he speaks to uh, Nicodemus in particular, uh, among other things. John chapter 4, uh, he speaks to the woman at the well. And then he says of her, oh, actually not says of her, he tells her, um, go down to verse 24 in John chapter 4. Okay, God is a spirit, and they that worship him uh, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee, am he. Uh, and then go down to verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Okay. So she believed on him after their interaction. Uh, just to synopsize the interaction that they had. He's tired, he comes into Samaria, he sits down at this well. She happens to be drawing and he asks her, you know, can you give me some water? And then she's like, well, wait a minute, you're a Jew. We don't have dealings with each other. Don't the Jews basically hate the Samaritans? And he says, well, just, you know, I need some water. I'd like some water. And then um, they go off a little bit more into conversation. Uh, he mentions, she mentions the fact about her husband, and she, he mentions, you know, you're right, you don't have a husband. Uh, you had five, and the one that you're presently with is not your husband, so you truly said, you know, you don't have a husband. And then at that point, that's when they start interacting over the fact that, well, wait a minute, you know, I perceive you're a prophet. Um, and then she starts going off a little bit of discourse as far as, well, the Samaritans believe this, the Jews believe that, and then, you know, he basically straightens her out and says, okay, well, you know not what you worship. You know, salvation is of the Jews. The Jews, the Jews are actually correct in, in asserting the fact that they're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. They're supposed to worship at the temple. Okay, that was God's plan uh, for them. And then he, we, we get into what we just mentioned here as far as that, okay, there's going to come a time that there's not going to be need for people to go down into Jerusalem, but they're going to be able to worship God where they're at. Uh, it's not that time yet. But it is coming. And then, uh, you know, God's the Spirit, they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And then she says um, about Messiah, and then He exposes Himself to her. As far as I know, He reveals, okay, hey, look, I'm Messiah. And from that point, she leaves, and then she says, hey, look, this is, this is Messiah. Uh, and so she has individuals that come to Him as a result of that. Uh, John chapter 6, we can go through every chapter, but John chapter 6 in particular. Uh, okay, 
This is after Jesus had fed a multitude. This is following uh, one of the, the, the feedings of the multitude. Uh, uh, start at uh, verse 22. We're going to skip around a little bit here. Okay, the, but the day following when the other people stood on, uh, or excuse me, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that uh, there were, uh, was none other boat there save the one whereunto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Albeit there came, an, there came other boats from Tiberias night into the place where they did eat bread after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping uh, and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they sent unto him, Rabbi, whence camest thou? Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye did, because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Okay, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. For the Son of Man shall give unto you, uh, for him that, uh, for him hath God the Father sealed. Okay, they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto him, or said unto them. This is the work of God, okay, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Okay, so his own testimony, okay, is that he personally has been sent. Now, he is God. Um, now, now they're going to get a little bit antagonistic, okay. They, they said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then, that we might see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat men in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay, now, mind you, this is after they've already been fed by him and as a multitude from a small amount that had been brought. Okay? Um, so he'd already performed that miracle. Amongst other miracles that he's already been performing um, prior to interaction with that crowd. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth uh, you the true bread from heaven. Okay, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, uh, and giveth life unto the world. And then they said unto him, uh, Lord, evermore give us his bread. And Jesus said unto him, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Um, then they're going to want to argue with him. They're basically saying, okay, or what are you saying? That we should eat you? We should drink? In other words, you are, you are asking us uh, to, to be cannibals? Um, he asserts again that, uh, verse 48, you know, I am the bread of life. Uh, verse 53. Okay, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye shall have no life in you. Okay, whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay, for my flesh is meat indeed, and then my blood is drink indeed. Okay, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Uh, skip down to. 61. Uh, okay, when the when the when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, that what he was saying. He that he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Okay, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up in uh, where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Um Then, then he's going to mention about Judas Iscariot here. But you have um, Jesus' assertion basically is that I, I am, I am supernatural. I'm God. In other words, if you don't take of me, I, you can't have eternal life. The same as he did with uh, Nicodemus and others previous. Uh, go to. Well, you know, uh, go to uh, John chapter 9. John chapter 9, uh, where he... Um, well, actually, John chapter 8, and then we'll go into chapter 9, and then we'll, we'll finish off here. There's a lot more we can look at. Um, we'll, for sake of time, we're going to have to go... We're going to have to jump in the middle of context. Um, this is 
Jesus at basically what would be the temple, and then he is being accosted by some Pharisees. Now, I, again, uh, okay, and then uh, verse 31, verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, then ans or they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we uh, were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin, and in the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever, uh, ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen of my, uh, with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen uh, with your father. Okay, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Uh, Jesus answered, uh, saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. So Abraham didn't do that. Okay, you do the deeds of your father. Then they said unto him, uh, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If, if God uh, were your father, you would love me. Uh, for I have proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Okay, why do you not understand my speech, even because you uh, because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not, which of you convinceth me of sin. In other words, no one can bring an accusation against him of the fact that he sinned because he hasn't. Okay, and I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Okay, he that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Um, we'll skip down just to Well, verse 51, okay, verily I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Okay, then saith the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil, Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater uh, than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead, whom thou makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say, uh, that he is your God, yet uh, ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should uh, say I know him not, I shall be a liar uh, like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Okay, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art yet fifty years old. Uh, thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, now this is an interesting response. I said, they, uh, they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus himself went out of the temple and through the midst of them and so passed by. Okay, now I know why, this seems kind of interesting. Why would they take up stones to kill him after he just finished stating? Now he, he had been arguing with them for quite a bit, saying a number of different things, but he, when, he, when he stated in particular, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Because yeah. he's declaring that he is God, or God's son. Yeah. So Jesus himself repeatedly claimed, you know, hey, I'm God. His, his own words, okay, I mean, the words of God, obviously, through previous uh, prophecy, and then his, his words, the actual things that he did. Yes? He was speaking in Hebrew, and the Hebrew word for I am is Yahweh. Yeah. So he was, he was plainly declaring himself. I, I am, I am the Creator. I'm Almighty, I'm Almighty God. Okay. The Jews understood that. <laughs> okay. So for anybody to deny, the, the whole point of these, uh, of what I'm bringing out here is, anybody that would deny the fact that Jesus is not God, go through Jehovah's Witness, go through the Mormons, go through um, Islam, or any other cult or quote unquote world religion. That would claim, yes. They'd seen his, they'd seen his works and his miracles and all this up to that point. I mean, 
Yeah, was they were around. He was who he said he was. They were around to experience that. Uh, I'm out of time for this one, but I was going to say John chapter 9. He's going to heal a blind man that was blind from birth. Uh, by the way, he also received worship. Uh, this blind man would worship him after he received the sight, after he was, uh, after he acknowledged, okay, because he was, he was questioned by, Jesus came and questioned him after he was already kicked out of the synagogue, uh, or excuse me, he was kicked out of the temple. Uh, he was kicked out of the temple um, for questioning, you know, hey, how is it that you guys don't know that, you know, so this guy's supernatural, you know, you guys are fighting him or, or antagonistic towards him. The fact is he healed me. I've been blind from birth. You know, who's done that? Who could do that except God? Uh, and then after he's kicked out, um, and wrongfully accused, and then, you know, Jesus approaches him. He's like, hey, have you worshipped, you know, the uh, Son of God? And he's like, well, I don't even know who that is. You know, if you point me to him, then I'll worship him. And he says, you know, I am he. You know, I'm, I, me speaking to you, is that's who I am. And then he, he bows down and he worship. Uh, you have the ten lepers that were healed. Uh, nine went forward, and then you have the one that came back, and he bowed down, and he worshipped. Uh, Jesus freely received worship. I know it seems like a minor thing, like, okay, what's the big deal with that? Culturally, in our day and age, that, it, that isn't necessarily a stigma. Um, they, that's worthy of death, if it were, uh, because they're not, they're asserting themselves to be, that would be blasphemy, if, under blasphemy law in Israel, they would be killed off for that, um, because they're not God. Okay, but Jesus did re freely receive worship. Any, oh, I'm out of time for this. Okay, you have the instances where you have Paul and Silas uh, when the pagans tried to give offerings to them. They rent their clothes and they cried out, you know, why do you so wickedly? You know, we're men, but you, like you. Same thing as with Peter. Uh, when he bowed on himself to when an angel would present himself, the angels that would present themselves whenever anybody would bow down to try and worship, and then they would cry out, no, because the fact is, is that, you know, we're a servant of God as you, you know. And the fact is, no one would receive worship as far as rightly. Um, now you see an instance where you have, um, not a group, but Herod, when he presented himself in Acts, Chapter five, or prior to chapter five, I'm sorry, that you have he gave a speech. People cried out, "Oh, he's like a god!" And then he was smoked with worms. Uh, died instantly, gave up the ghost, and then his body was smoked with worms. <clears throat> but Jesus re freely received worship. His works uh, testified uh, of his supernatural nature that he's God Almighty. The prophecy that was given in Scripture and his own words uh, were testimony to the fact that Jesus is Almighty God. We're out of time. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. So next week we're going to be looking at uh, necess necessity of blood atonement. Okay.